My name is Emily Thurlow. Um, I'm here today on behalf of um, SPJ New England, and I'm here with Andy Drubnik Holm. Andy is the editor in chief of PolitiFact. Uh, she helped launch the site in 2007 and was a reporter on the team that won the Pulitzer Prize for its coverage of the 2008 election. And she's going to talk to us today about the covering COVID crisis and misinformation thereof. So yeah. thanks for being here. Great. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, we're a small group. That's nice. So I'm going to talk briefly and then we can just open it up for discussion and questions. Um, if you are watching this online, I have a small PowerPoint that I'm going to show. And if you are just listening to the audio, don't worry about it. I will narrate uh, what I'm talking about. So I am going to attempt to share my screen. Okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, I'm the editor in chief of PolitiFact, and we're the national politics fact checking website. I hope people have seen our site before. If you haven't, it's a lot of fun. If you're interested in politics or public policy or debunking hoaxes, we do all of that. Um, we started at a newspaper, the Tampa Bay Times, in August 2007. And we started as an election year project to cover the uh, election that ended up being um, between Barack Obama and John McCain. But we fact checked the primaries um, when we started. We're the first website to win the Pulitzer Prize for the fact checking of that 2008 election. And then a couple of years ago, um, because PolitiFact um, had grown, we moved from the newspaper and now we're part of the independent nonprofit, the Pointer Institute, which um, also owns the newspaper. It's a very unusual story, the Tampa Bay Times and the Pointer Institute, but uh, the Pointer Institute owns the Tampa Bay Times and now they own PolitiFact as an independent nonprofit. And we fact checked uh, more than 17,000 claims since we started and we have local partners in um, 13 states. Um, the most, the closest one to New England is uh, Vermont. We're partners with the VT Digger. Um, although in the past we've done a lot with New Hampshire, the Concord Monitor. Um, but some of our biggest state partnerships are um, Wisconsin, California, and Texas. <laughs> I just hit it on my. So, yes. Somebody needs, I think someone needs to mute themselves. Um, so our methodology is uh, we do fact checking. All of our reports are similar. We say, this is the statement we're checking. Here's the person who said it. Here's the venue where they said it. And then we go and research and we find out if it's true. And the sources that we use are primary documents, um, independent experts, uh, databases. Um, wherever the fact check takes us, uh, we look for sources. Um, we want things to be pretty bulletproof. If you're holding yourself up on the internet as a fact checker, your research has to be very solid. And um, we do a lot of training and we have a lot of vetting of the fact checks. Every fact check ends up with three editors rate, uh, reading it before we publish. And we list and we hyperlink all our sources. We have the ratings. If you've been to the PolitiFact website, you know that they're true, mostly true, half true, mostly false, false, and pants on fire. And then we have a, a corrections process too. Um, so I am going to talk about three fact checks here um, and I'm gonna give you the links to them as soon as I'm done. I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. Um, so, uh, but I picked some that I thought would be particularly good um, for, uh, for reporters um, working today um, because I do think PolitiFact does a lot of national fact checking, but fact checking can be done on the local level. So wherever you're working, if you're working for a city-based or a state-based news outlet, you can do fact checking too. Um, PolitiFact has this very um, branded format, but you can do a regular news story and put fact checking elements in it. You can do in what we call inline corrections, where you quote a politician saying something, but you say, oh, that's wrong. Um, so I just really wanna encourage you to see this as you can do this in your own way with your own journalism. And I selected this check from Wisconsin. So this is Wisconsin Republican legislative leaders. They say, we are currently using only 
around 20% of our testing capacity and we rated it half true. I'll tell you just briefly, testing is a tremendously contested issue. Um, all of the scientists that we've talked to say there's not enough testing. And um, the Trump administration and the Republicans have been trying to put um, a happier face on this lack of testing by saying, oh, we, we can test, testing is great. Um, and this is a pretty typical claim that we've seen um, that said like, we've got lots of testing capacity. We're not even using all the testing capacity we have. Um, but we rated this one half true. The situation in Wisconsin is that, yes, they have testing capacity, um, but they are having problems with collection. So like sticking swabs up people's noses and then putting the swabs into a test tube with some solution to preserve it. That's what they're having problems with in Wisconsin. So you can have all the lab capacity that you want, but if you can't get any samples to the lab, there's not gonna be that much testing going on. And this fact check outlines that and um, rated it half true. And uh, I'm gonna give you the link in just a minute so you can go and look at the actual report or you can Google it if you want to right now. Okay, the next one, we've also been fact checking a lot of uh, misinformation. So this is a Facebook post, we rated it false. It says a photo shows the same exact people at two different beaches in Los Angeles County and Jacksonville, Florida. Um, this is, the insinuation of this post was that um, the idea of overcrowding is overblown, that it's not that bad, but that's not what this, the photo showed. This was a glitch in some of the reporting. We rated this false. It, people were not trying to use a photo for two different locations. Um, it was something that got mixed up on the internet. So we rated this one false. Um, and there's a lot like we can even have a whole separate discussion about misinformation because we've been doing a lot of fact checking of this. Um, then we have Donald Trump. This one is pants on fire. He says the coronavirus snuck up on us, adding that it is a very unforeseen thing. Um, President Trump has been doing a lot of spin on coronavirus, trying to make it posit more positive than it is. This one was false on several levels. That's why I got rated pants on fire. Um, first off, his own healthcare officials told him in January and February that this was happening. And then uh, there have been pandemic um, preparations since the George W. Bush administration warning that um, that a pandemic was possible and that the U.S. should get ready. And uh, when we've looked at the history, it's like sometimes the U.S. has gotten ready and sometimes it hasn't. It's been very streaky. And then finally, I want to highlight this tool. Um, this is called the Fact Check Explorer. This is just a little screenshot. This is what it'll look like if you pull it up. Um, this is a website that Google has made for journalists and fact checkers so that you can search fact checking content. And the little link is down at the bottom, that toolbox.google.com slash fact check slash explorer. Um, if you go to this page and you put some search terms in here like coronavirus testing or liquor stores, essential businesses, it will search um, with some of the vetted fact checking sources and pull up fact checks. And it's and I would just say, like, it's a really great tool for seeing what other people have fact checked because a really critical component of fact checking is first looking to see what other people have done so that you don't have to reinvent the real. So I'm going to stop sharing my, I'm going to try to stop sharing my uh, screen. Oh, I paused it. How do I stop it? And I'll give you the links and then. Um, I would love to take some questions just to keep the conversation going from there. Uh, Emily, I can't stop sharing my screen. I'm trying. I can't see my my pointer is part of the problem. Oh, here we go. Stop sharing. Great. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me put the links in here. Um, but I, I would love to, if anybody wants to either unmute themselves and just ask a question or put a question in the group chat, um, there's lots of things we could talk about. 
as far as um, more specifics about how we do fact checking or misinformation or what you're seeing in your local areas. I'd love to just uh, hear from you. I was going to kick it off. Um, I was curious, uh, what are some of the, how do you handle something like this when the truth isn't always clear? Yeah, I mean, I have to say I'm working on a piece right now about what we don't know about coronavirus. And just to give you some of the big picture areas of what we don't know, we really don't know how widespread the infection is, like how many people have it. Um, most of the testing in the United States has been limited to people who are having serious symptoms. Um, there are many anecdotal reports of people who have been refused tests um, because they have light symptoms or sometimes no symptoms, even though they know they've been around someone who has coronavirus. So the testing situation, it's like, it's really bad. Like as far as, because the idea is if you really want to know how far it's spread, you do some sort of representative sample of your community and test, um, you know, 500 people, 1,000 people in a given area. You might have to test more than that, but it's it's similar to how we cover polling. You know, you snapshot an area and see how many people tested positive, but we can't do that right now because there's not enough testing. So we so even though the you'll see on cable news every night they're putting numbers of positive cases because the medical authorities do have to report when someone tests positive and they are posting fatalities, but those numbers are not complete. They're not anywhere near complete. So that's huge. Um, another big thing is that they don't know the, um, the fatality rate. Um, and if you've seen any numbers, you have to be really cautious about that because um, if you just take like the number of, deaths and divided by the number who have tested positive it's still not an accurate rate because so many people have it and haven't been and haven't been tested i mean we know that people have been exposed to the coronavirus and haven't been tested so that is also uh like you can't really say how lethal it is um what we try to do is be very clear about what we know and what we don't know and i think um I think the danger comes when we want to suggest that we know more than we do. And um, I just think we have to get really comfortable with saying like, this isn't known. These are the numbers that are available, but they're not complete. Um, there's a really excellent article in the Atlantic that just published by um, Ed Wong about this and all the, um, all the uncertainty. I'm gonna see if I can find it because I, I sent it to my staff and I said, I want everybody to read this um, because it was so uh, good as far as articulating like why everything seems so strange. And the headline is why the coronavirus is so confusing. And then just one more thing I wanted to highlight um, that we don't know um, is that the symptoms, what we've been seeing or the symptoms are so different for different people. Um, as, the, as the scientists and the doctors have been studying it, like when this first started, everybody said fever, coughing, and um, those were the main symptoms. But now they're seeing things like old people don't necessarily run fevers. Like people, some of the nursing home patients, they're not running fevers. Some of them are, but some of them aren't. Um, some of the younger patients are coming in with um, this, what they call chill blains, which I had never heard of. It's kind of like a frostbitten toe. And that's a symptom in younger people. Now they're not really sick, but they do have it. And that's the response they're showing. Um, in some of the elderly people are just having symptoms of like disorientation. And when they have coronavirus, they're not having the coughing. Um, so, and then some of the patients who are in the hospital are, um, they're not, they're, they're dying of, of different issues. Like some of them have had strokes, which implies blood clots. Um, they're not all having, um, you know, severe respiratory distress. So it's a really weird, um, it's a really weird disease that, and 
yeah, I'll just stop right there and see if there are any <laughs> other questions. Because uh, there is a lot that's very strange about the disease. Does anyone else have questions before I, I keep asking? If you do, you yes. can ask. I'm Heidi. I'm Heidi Viertaler. I'm from uh, Port. I'm in the Portland, Maine area, and I'm calling. I'm not calling. <laughs> Getting used to this new technology here. I'm wondering if you've heard anything about this Verify group. This it seems to be a consortium of various different news outlets that may be run by Tegna and they like to to do all these, you know, verified these like Jason Puckett, I think, is one of the, the team leaders, but they go through a process of showing why various different things are false or not true. And they have like little check marks if it's true or red X's if it's false. And I'm wondering if you've heard of that and what kind of weight you give to that sort of reportage. And if, have you heard of it? I have, yes. And um, what do you think? Because it seems to be given a lot of stock, but I've also wondered if they're really doing the greatest job that they could be doing. Yeah, so this is um, Tegna's, uh, they call them Verify, and they're segments that appear on local news uh, stations. And um, I will tell you, Heidi, I haven't seen everything that they've done. What I've seen, I have liked. I thought they were good reports, and especially being done for television, which is a really challenging um, medium, I think, to do fact-checking on, because you have to be concise and you have to keep people's attention as they're watching. I think the fact checking um, that we do in print, it's like we can really get into the weeds. We don't have to, um, we don't have, we can list all of our sources. I just feel like it's a little bit more of a challenge to do on TV, but not impossible. And we've had TV partners over the years. Um, the Titan of fact checks are good. I will tell you though, like fact checking is really challenging. And even reputable organizations um, find their fact checks are up for dispute and discussion and disagreement. Um, I, uh, so like if you're a journalist and you wanna use a fact check, um, I mean, I know this sounds obvious, but I do think we all need to remember it. Like we can't just take it at face value. We have to look at it ourselves and examine it and look at the sources. Um, and I would even say, like, that's true for PolitiFact. Because um, uh, sometimes, like, there are a lot of, like, just like regular journalism, like, sometimes we make mistakes, and there are things that can go wrong with a fact check, like you miss a key piece of information, or you don't fully represent someone else's point of view. Um, so, like, if you ever see a fact check and you think, or that's not quite right, like, what I think is, like either I wonder if they really saw everything or sometimes, and this is, I even, it happens to me. It's like, sometimes I'm like, well, I just don't like that finding. I mean, <laughs> the tendency, we don't like what a fact checker finds to want to pick it apart. And that gets into kind of the psychology of fact checks. Um, but I've liked what I've seen of the Tegna fact checks. Um, some of the other major fact checking organizations that I would recommend, I mean, certainly I recommend PolitiFact, um, factcheck.org is a longtime fact checker. They're affiliated with the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and though they're a university group, they have a lot of former journalists working for them. And then the Washington Post fact checker is another good site. Um, and then in recent years, Facebook has started funding fact checkers. So um, the AP is doing a lot of fact checks around for Facebook and around misinformation. And so is, and USA Today just started as well. So um, we're seeing more fact checking um, from that. So. Angie, Aviva has sent a message through the chat. I don't know if you can see that. I do see it. 
um, with, with all the different symptoms, is corona ultimately verifiable by testing? And what about Governor Cuomo's comment about an East Coast virus and a West Coast virus? A neighbor who has relatives in the medical profession says that hospitals are getting government funds per corona patient. Is that so? Oh, wow, such interesting questions here. Um, let me talk about the hospitals and the government funds because we did a fact check on that. The, we've rate, we rated a similar claim to that half true. Um, it's tr it's the sense in that it's true is that um, uh, the hospitals are paid by patient and by treatment, and the government has tried to increase funding for coronavirus patients to help them along, but there's not any there's not any real incentive for them to inflate numbers or anything like that. And um, you should go try and, or I'll see if I can find the fact check that we did. Um, because it's like, it's like, I don't know, do you think hospitals are inflating cancer patients? You know, I mean, and that's not even, it's just kind of a weird claim to make to suggest that the hospitals are getting more funds for coronavirus patients. Um, because they're not getting, they're just, they've been getting, they're getting paid um, on a kind of a per procedure basis that the way they always have. So like, it's just kind of a weird claim. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Um, the East Coast virus and the West Coast virus, that is super interesting um, because, uh, because um, there have been a lot of questions about why the virus is more fatal in some places than others, and there aren't really good answers for that. Like Italy, it has been extremely deadly. And the scientists say, like, we think it's because Italy has an older than average population, but like other countries have older than average populations and are not having the same thing. Um, the Post did an excellent story. The Washington Post did a really good story on this on Friday, where they talked about like it's just really baffling the way some places seem to be hit harder than others, and they they have some theories, but they don't have anything firm on why it is. Um, and so the whole like East Coast virus versus West Coast is like really. Um, the numbers are certainly worse in New York than they are in California, but it's kind of inexplicable as to why. I mean, you can, you can say maybe it's because New York has a subway and there's more people per square mile. And the best you can say about that is maybe. Um, the other, uh, just a few more of these questions from the chat. Um, remdesivir, we did do a story on that uh, recently. Um, it does seem somewhat promising. I mean, for me as a journalist, it just seems really like too soon to make sweeping statements about it. Um, you know, a lot of this medication stuff, and I would say the same thing is true of hydrochloroquine, um, is that they need to do more tests and see, although hydrochloroquine, they had to stop a test because people were having adverse reactions. So like you could make a case that um, remdesivir is more promising than that. but. Um, it's still like early going. Um, and at, you know, uh, like I said, we did the check, we did a story on that because we didn't feel comfortable fact checking the claims because it was too early. And sometimes when we, when we have a situation where we can't, we feel like we can't fact check something because the facts aren't known, we do a story instead and say we're not rating this on our truth and meter. Um, but we are gonna do a story saying, here's everything we know and here's everything we don't know. Um, Heidi asked, what about Snopes? Um, with Snopes is really interesting case because they've been around forever and they started off fact checking what they called urban folklore. And um, I think a lot of their fact checks are really good. I think you have to look at them on a case by case basis so you know um, how they're coming to their conclusions. Um, but I do think Snopes is generally reputable. Um, they've been having some, some, uh, I don't know, some sort, some kind of problems lately with their, um, with their capacity. The Post did a story about how they were overwhelmed by coronavirus fact checking, 
um, which I thought was kind of interesting because with PolitiFact, I would say we are very, very busy, but we are not overwhelmed. Um, so they seem to be having some issues with their ownership and their management. But I think the fact checking is still very good. And I certainly look at what they have to do, um, what they're doing and what they're saying. One of the things that PolitiFact that's part of our process is when we do a new fact check, we look at all what all the other fact checkers have said about the topic that we're looking into. And we certainly look at Snopes reports and take them, um, take them seriously and see um, what they found and what they had to say. And again, that's using that Google fact checking search tool. It's super helpful if you have to write about something that you're not factually sure about because um, the thing that I love about the fact checking community in the US is there's a lot of fact checkers so you don't have to just rely on one of them. You can look at a, like two or three different reports. I mean, the problem of course is time, <laughs> like how, how much time do you have? But it's nice for me to be able to say if we're fact checking something and we're rating it false and then we go and see like if the post and factcheck.org and Snopes have all said it's false too, then we feel pretty comfortable about, um, you know, that we're on the right track. Whereas like every now and then the fact checkers come up with different answers and then we have to look into it more deeply because usually there's some reason why we're coming up with different answers. And usually it's because we're fact checking a different facet of the same statement. So we're not, it's, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes fact checkers do disagree. Oh, let's see, Heidi has raised her hand. Nope. Did you want to? I, 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 Heidi. Yeah, I did. I wanted to ask a question about um, that's maybe slightly off topic. We live up here in Maine, and there is a project that there that Central Maine Power, which is owned by Spanish, it's Spanish-owned Avangrid and Iberdrola, who have a notoriously internationally bad reputations and central main power is like on the very bottom of all of the customer service represented like JD power and they're trying to ramrod through a project with hydro Quebec called the New England clean energy connect and they are at they are putting so many advertisements, which those of us that are part of the NECEC commune, the say no to NECEC community have been able to debunk and are, have, they're forcing us all to, to watch these things on all of our various platforms. And I'm wondering if there's any way that we could somehow shut their ads down because I don't know if because they paid for these advertisements but don't aren't advertisements supposed to be true and based on fact and who pay like you know where and how can we stop them if we know that they're selling lies and and is there a way that you can take them to court for not, and what about the, the responsibility of the news outlets to make sure that their ads are fact checked and all that? And I guess that gets into campaign ads too, is how can stations and, and, and media outlets be sure that they're getting the truth reported in the advertisements that they carry. You know, like the like tobacco ads used to be major things and they're not anymore. Yeah, Heidi, that's a really good question. It's also somewhat complicated. Um, yeah, it seems- I'm aware of that. <laughs> I mean, that's honestly, I would point you to a media lawyer for that. Oh, okay. I will I will tell you that our, in our experience with fact checking, that um, the, the area that is most sensitive to accuracy in the ads is broadcast television. Um, and that, because what we see during election time is we'll fact check TV ads and then the campaigns 
If we say something is false, the campaigns will often write letters to the TV stations saying they need to pull ads because they're not accurate. And it has to do with stuff that I don't entirely understand about the history of broadcast and, and the legality there. Um, newspapers, on the other hand, where I've worked and it's where my career has been, will often say like, we don't fact check ads. We consider ourselves a platform for the community. People who want to take out ads can, you know, can make their case and um and and they they're more they've been like more kind of hands off although newspapers will also have like these standards that are sometimes articulated sometimes not about um advertising um and then online uh um it's it's like goes almost platform by platform but they seem to be <laughs> They, they often say they want to give people their say and not like pull their ads because of fact checking. But sometimes they do, sometimes they do uh, suppress ads because of fact checking. So it's a little complicated and it goes kind of almost platform by platform. Uh, Aviva says most ads exaggerate, but if it can be shown there was some harm like tobacco, you may have a case. Um, I'm trying to think what other organizations would follow that. Um, but I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I do know that broadcast TV is most sensitive to that though, for whatever that's worth. I was um, curious, you had, um, uh, I've noticed now some of these pop-up websites that are so, they mirror whatever their factual site is so much. Do you have challenges with that within that, uh, at PolitiFact as well? What I'm not sure what you're talking about. What kind of sites? Um, so when you have these sites that are that their uh, URL is so close to what the oh, yes. site is, do you have that kind of challenge as well with Politifact? Oh, like what people imitating our site? Or, yeah. Uh, we have. I'm not aware of that problem. I know our engagement editor is on this uh, or was on this thing. Maybe she's seen that. I have not seen that. We have not had problems with people imitating us. Now we've had, pro we've, we've kind of been on the, um, we fact checked a lot of hoax content where it's a, a site that's pretending to be USA Today or ABC News, but it's not. It's like, it's like abcnews.co instead of .com. And um, we used to do a lot of fact checks of those. I think some of the, um, I, I wonder, I don't know, but I wonder if, um, some of the search engines have gotten uh, tougher on those kinds of sites that seem to be clearly mimicking um, another site because they don't seem as prevalent as they were in um, 2016. And uh, I will tell you also like the, the fact checking landscape has been changing a lot over the years. I think um, uh, we, we've seen misinformation go from a small part of the political dialogue to a much larger part in 2016. And then since 2016, the platforms like Facebook and Google have gotten much more um, sensitive to the problem and are taking more steps to try to address it. Although they also have, um, they also will say like, we don't want to do censorship. And Frankly, they don't want to have to judge content. So the some of the steps they've taken have been um, small, but I do think the the situation is better than it was in 2016, um, just because of more awareness about misinformation and how um, organized campaigns of disinformation work on the internet, even though there's still quite a good bit out there. You think you think it's better now than 2016? Yeah, I think 2016 was a super low point. Um, I know that, uh, uh, like, in 2016, just to give you, like, why is it different then and now? Well, um, just to, let me give you a Facebook example. So PolitiFact is part of what Facebook calls its third-party independent fact-checkers. So Facebook has contracts with all these fact checkers and we see content that has been flagged by Facebook users and we fact check it. And if we find posts that are wrong, Facebook will um, suppress the posts down the newsfeed. And if one publisher gets multiple 
strikes against it, they basically take away their ability to monetize content. Mm -hmm. So they can't, they can't make money off of their false news. That was really different in 2016. And if you saw the stories, a lot of them t talked about teenagers in Eastern Europe running fake news sites through Facebook to make money and they just make money off of clicks. You can't do that today. Um, it just, you wouldn't, you'd run up out of the fact checkers and it, it just, it just wouldn't work. I mean, you could try to do it, but it wouldn't be profitable or nearly as profitable. Now, there are still people who have other motivations besides like basically clickbait money-making schemes that do misinformation. So it hasn't gone away. Like you have people who are politically motivated to spread misinformation. You still have Russia and China that do disinformation campaigns. Um, and you still have um, basically internet trolls who put out misinformation just because they like fooling people. So you still have all of those groups. But, um, but the other stuff I think has gotten a lot better. Is it fair? I mean, from my perspective and my coverage area, it seems like it's more saturated than it ever was. And I don't know if it's from my readership. I know a lot more people are home, so they're sharing all kinds of things that they've never even read. But yeah. Yeah. Are you like, what kind of stuff are you seeing, Emily? I'm just curious. Um, a lot of uh, the vaccination uh things that that in particular i've seen more than i've ever seen that it's bill gates is out to get us um yeah that that on that wavelength yeah well once once coronavirus hit i mean we did see in misinformation explode and that follows a pattern we've seen with other news events like we saw a lot of misinformation after the las vegas shooting um after mass shootings um, but other events as well. But um, but yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. Since coronavirus started, things, is, things have gotten much worse as far as misinformation has gone. Um, Anti-vaccination misinformation has been out there for a really long time. Um, and it seems to be getting another second wind here. Um, the Bill Gates misinformation is new. Um, or I should say new-ish, um, there was some negative um, misinformation about Bill Gates before this, but it's really taken off now. Um, and uh, it's just like, and I, I don't understand where everything is coming from either. I know there's misinformation being pushed by, or I believe there's misinformation being pushed by China and Russia, because it seems like it's been fairly well documented. Um, but some of it is just kind of baffling. Like the anti-vaccine misinformation is strange, but um, yeah, there is more that way. And we've been busier than ever, so. So how does um, that change how you guys do your job then? If, it's, if it seems like more and con I mean constant. Yeah, I mean, we're doing, how does it change how we do our job? It doesn't change how we do our job. like. Um, we follow our methodology and um, uh, we have that published on our website. Like, so we, we check, we have a checklist for going through things. So we look at other fact checks. We ask the person who made the statement. We do um, intensive Google searches and database searches and we talk to experts. So like all that part stays the same, but as far as fact checking the misinformation, like we're just doing an awful lot of it now. Um, we, had made plans to ramp up our coverage for this election year and um we just basically have kind of turbocharged it early basically but instead of fact checking uh, election claims right now we're pretty much doing a lot of coronavirus misinformation i mean like if you go and look at our site right now it's a ton of coronavirus misinformation and some politicians but a reporter asked me last week, like, when are we going to get back to doing more politicians? And I was like, well, I'm not really sure. We're seeing a lot of online misinformation. Um, we're still doing politicians. Um, but it, like you can see that the site has tilted more towards online misinformation the past couple months. Heidi sent, uh, there's a couple more questions too. Um, Heidi and Aviva have some. Uh, yeah. 
Let's see. Um, Aviva wanted to know who follows fact checkers, journalists, and who else? Um, we've done some readership studies. We do have a lot of journalists who follow us um, who are looking to see what um, we're fact checking when they're covering breaking news events and, and like speeches and stuff like that. Um, we also have a lot of people who are just really interested in politics. We have a lot of politics junkies who read us. And then we just have people who uh, just are interested in fact checking as a framework for reporting. Um, some people are just really like the genre. Um, we get a lot of public policy people. We get a lot of educators. Um, we get a lot of people who are just naturally curious. Um, so uh, we get that's I think that's our main audience. Um, let's see. Uh, another question about Facebook and the power ads. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, if, if you are on Facebook and you want to report content, you just look for the posts and the three dots on the slide. Let's see. Um, and then they give, offer you some options for, um, for uh, reporting. You can report like bullying, harassment, false news, that kind of thing. Any other questions? So when you're, you're choosing, um, well, when this misinformation is out there, how, how are you navigating that? And how are you, this is, we're going to deal with this today. We're going to deal with that. Right. Well, we, we have a, we have 12 full-time staffers and we operate a lot like a you know, traditional newsroom, especially now in coronavirus, we're checking in on zoom together every morning. And we're um, and we make decisions based off of what we've seen, off of what readers have asked us for. We get a lot of reader email, and people ask us to fact check things. Um, we're trying to use our news judgment and do a diversity of topics and a diversity of speakers, just like a a newsroom. I mean, most of us come out of newspapers, so we kind of have that mentality, like a, a newspaper morning meeting, where we all get together and we'll be like, okay, what's hot. And um, we, we do notice that um, our readers and our traffic does better when we fact check topics in the news. Like, I mean, in theory, we could be doing fact checks right now about like oh, the EPA or, um, you know, steel imports or whatever. But like, really, people want to read fact checks about coronavirus, you know? Um, and then, uh, then we have President Trump, who I haven't talked much about, but he's like a full-time fact-checking job in himself because of the way he likes to talk and the way he likes to um, spontaneously, uh, he just <laughs> likes to kind of like think off the top of his head. So there's always a lot to fact-check with um, President uh, President Trump. So, so after, when you fact-check something, after you put something out and there's still misinformation that follows, what's usual protocol? Because that back and forth is what I'm interested in. Like, like when there's, it's still there? Well, with the, it's a kind of interesting because with the Facebook program, we can come back and tag content again. Like if we do a fact-check of one piece of content and then someone else is doing it, we can come back and tag it and say like, and that one is also false. Um, we do a lot of posting on social media, on uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, with our own posts. Um, uh, but, you know, some people are very resistant to fact checking. I mean, fact checking is not a cure all. Um, th there are several things that President Trump likes to say over and over again, and he gets these favorite talking points. And we fact check him and the Washington Post fact checks him. And everybody fact checks him and he just keeps going like lately he's been saying that america's done more coronavirus testing than all the other countries combined well i think an intelligent eighth grader could go on the internet and prove that that is not true if you just take all the published testing numbers they don't add up like that um but he seems to keep saying it um in, in different cases in, in the past like sometimes politicians will say oh the fact checkers are wrong Right. Um, Ted Cruz is an example of that. He wrote a whole chapter in his book about how he thinks the fact checkers are just like liberals masquerading as journalists trying to bring down conservatives, which I don't agree with and I think is inaccurate, provably inaccurate, but 
you know, I mean, we've all seen how politicians like to make the media the enemy. And uh, in fact, checking is the victim. But like, I think we just keep going back to facts and evidence. And it's like, it's a long game, you know? And like, when I get readers, like emailing me and saying like, oh, you're out to get President Trump. You know, why are you picking on him all the time? I'm like, what what facts did we get wrong? What What is it? What is your evidence? Um, because I think if we just, I think as journalists, because of our ethical obligation to truth, we just need to keep emphasizing, like, if something is true, there is evidence for it. If something is untrue, there is evidence for it. What does the evidence say? I mean, we can spend a lot of time pe- talking about people's motivations, and motivations are important in politics. But if you're talking about fact checking, it's just like, if it's wrong, where's your, where's your proof? Where's your proof? So I try to always steer the conversations back that way because um, it just makes me feel like I'm saying instead of <laughs> not. Because, <laughs> I mean, it's a hard time right now. I think, like, you know, this is – I'm glad SPJ has hosted this. It's a hard time to be a journalist, you know. There's a lot of – there are a lot of critics out there. There's a lot of criticism. But I do think if we um, – if we stick to our ethical values of accuracy, fairness, um, representation, I think that we will be okay. So he's got one more question. If uh, there's that, oh yeah, Aviva, yes. I, I was a victim of uh, the Berkshire record going down. <laughs> mm. yeah. I'm so sorry, Emily. Yeah, it's it's been a little tough. It's but it's one of those things where I know very well that people need news and accurate news right now. Yeah, yeah, and please, please, everybody, go check out the Pointer Institute. They've been trying to really cover it, cover the struggles of local news and offer some help. Um, and there's a lot of programming that is um, either you know free of charge or optionally charged. Um, we are, the Pointer Institute as an institution is trying to support the local news ecosystem, and um, it's a really tough time, um, but I think uh, we just got to keep on doing our best, and, you know, because we are, we are a profession that's mentioned in the Constitution, the free press, so we have to keep doing our jobs. Sorry, Heidi, didn't mean to hijack your question. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's no worries. I'm really grateful to learn all of the work that you guys are doing. First of all, before I get to my question, I would like to ask a quick question. Are we going to get a recording of this when we're finished? Um, I've been recording this, and I believe um, those from SBJ are as well, and I think they're going to post it online. Okay. so my question goes back to what you were talking about with Trump saying all of these lies about different things from his podium. And I've been, I, I'm an environmentalist too. I'm also a journalist and I have a little bit of a, a, a bias in my journalism and my posts on Facebook, but it's, I'm wondering what we can do to debunk all of these things where Trump is saying that the fossil fuel is so great, the fossil fuel industries are so great, and that it's great that we're going to be shutting down all of this public land and opening it up for fossil fuel and extractive stuff, and what we can do to stop his, his, bending of the truth where it comes to our environment and how we can protect ourselves. I mean, the cancer and death alley along the Mississippi are where the highest rates of per capita in the whole country, even over New York, of where uh, COVID rates have happened because of the asthma due to all the plastic factories there. And so how can we make sure that 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 people like that are given justice and all the people in indian country and the southwest and stuff are given the right resources to get to to be able to to have the news give the right 
uh, coverage to all these things so that things are 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 more just for for people out there and for our environment. Well, I think when you talk about the question of justice, you're talking about things that are bigger than just journalism. I mean, those are society-wide problems, and I think some of them are not the province of um, journalists. I think we need to give people information. But the stuff you're talking about sounds like, uh, you know, stuff for the law, the legal system, and the political system for advocacy. So, um, I mean, for me, I I try to stay. Um, I try to stay within the problems that I feel like fact checking can address and journalism can address, which means when we see false statements, we fact check them. But like, I, I, you know, I think that there is a sense out there that um, some people want to see journalism solve problems that are beyond the power of journalism to solve. They really need to be addressed in the political realm, the, the legal realm. Uh, yeah, so. Um, Emily, I'm out of time. I have to get to another meeting, but I did want to just say I really love talking to everybody and this was really fun. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, sorry for some mix ups in the beginning, but yes, this was great. It's okay. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you.